I'm Jim Pickerson. And I'm David Korn. And together, we're, we're bloggingheads.tv. TV. TV. That was one of our better efforts, I think, David. <laughs> I think we should quit here. <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs> uh, uh, unanimous agreement on every, every topic. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, so let's just get right to it. The big story really is... This is, this is Wednesday the 2nd, so... Yeah, you know, yeah, and things are moving fast, so we right. should say that. Sometimes we try to try to cloud it up a little bit, you know, so it, we look right. like we're, we're right on top of things when people at home get to watch this. But um, given that anything can happen, and it's Super Bowl week... You know, anything can happen Super Bowl week. Uh, any, we any, given, any, any given Sunday in Cairo. Any given, you know, who knows who's going to win. But, yeah. but, but the big story, obviously, is Egypt. In America, you know, the big part of the story is the Obama administration's response, handling, management, whatever you want to call it, of this, of this crisis. And as you, had, you had a strong opinion on that. I saw that in Politics Daily this morning. Well, I had a strong... Well, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you my opinion in a second. But, but as we're talking now... Uh, today was really the first day of, of Mubarak's crackdown, um, and there's been a lot more violence than we've seen in previous days, and the situation seems very flexible. You know, we, it, I mean, it's, I, it's, it seems untenable that Mubarak's going to stay in power, um, particularly after he said he's not going to run for re-election, but it's really hard to figure out what's going to happen in the next couple of days. Agreed? I, I, I do. Uh, uh, yeah. so, but but, but I, I think that, right, it's, it's possible to imagine Barak is, is head of Egypt by the end of this year, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we, there were moments when we thought the Iranians could not you know, right. survive, and they did. And even though Mubarak said he won't run for re-election, that doesn't mean he can't impose martial law and stay in power and cancel the elections. He never promised not to cancel the elections. He never, he never promised not to cross his fingers. Yes. Uh, but you, know, you asked my opinion. I, I, I thought up until this moment, and I reserve you know, the right to, to change my view, that the White House has done a pretty decent job in a very difficult situation. Uh, I think... It, the Obamas are very clear that the that the gripes are legitimate, that the protesters have a right to be doing what they're doing, and that uh, Mubarak shouldn't stay on as president or leader of the country, and that there should be a transition. And as he said last night, uh, it, it should begin now, not wait until September, as, Sec as Press Secretary Robert Gibbs said at the White House press briefing just shortly before we began taping this, now means now. You know, he actually said now means yesterday. And so I think their rhetoric sure could be tougher. It could you know, be tougher on, on Mubarak in, in public. But I think they're leaning on him somewhat hard and, and trying not to lean on him harder in public. While it seems to be quite clear that in all the conversations behind, behind closed doors between Ambassador Frank Wisner went over there between Secretary uh, Bob Gates and Admiral Mullen and their uh, Mullen and their counterparts. They're all saying more or less the same thing: leave on your own terms. You know, have a, have a, have. A, this is a time for an exit strategy now. Make it work orderly. Don't crack down. Don't try to stay in. We want to see Mubarak gone. And if he's you know, and up until the crackdown, it looked like that might have been the right way to go. If Mubarak's going to sort of, you know, clamp down and dig his heels in now, then they may have to reconfigure the public end of their strategy. How does it look to you? Well, I, I must say I'm having a hard time. I, I don't have any criticism over uh, how President Obama has handled this, uh, 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 none whatsoever. Uh, um, but I'm a little puzzled over which uh, U.S. policy is in place now. Is it the policy of dealing with President Mubarak because or Egypt because that's a vital ally and you know the war on terror and with Israel and blah blah blah, or are we for human rights? Uh, 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 you know both policies seem to have been in place for the last right. 30 years. I mean, I mean, you know, George W. Bush talked a lot about human rights. Uh, so did Jimmy Carter. Uh, uh, so have a lot of presidents at all presidents at one time or another. And I, I find it sort of amusing that the, that the foreign policies in a, in a kind of a grim way. That the foreign policy establishment has had so much trouble 
uh, deciding what it really and truly wants. I think they've been sort of caught by the rhetoric on the one hand, saying democracy, human rights, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, you see Les Gelb, the, you know, who's about as much of a pillar of the establishment as you can find in America, the, the former New York Times columnist, former sub-cabinet member of the Clinton, of the, or the Carter State Department, yep. and, of course, the President Emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, you know, which is it, guys? Which, which, which is it they really want? I, I'm sort of not convinced uh, that they don't, even if they're, they agree that Mubarak has to go now as a matter of practicality, is yeah. I sort of think they kind of will, sort of a little sorry to see him go. Well, this reminds me of the old Saturday Night Live routine, which, one of the earlier ones, in which they, you know, they have one of those fake commercials, and they say, it's a floor wax. No, it's a dessert <laughs> topping. No, it's a floor wax. No, it's a dessert <laughs> topping. Actually, it's both. Right, right, exactly. You know? And so uh, this is, a, I think, a decades-long tension in our foreign policy that doesn't apply just to Egypt, but is, you know, applies to China. You know, we're going to be tough on China, and we're going to you know, call for human rights, and liberals like that, and evangelical Christians like that, and other people like that, too. But then Tiananmen Square comes along, and... This is actually when you were working for President George H.W. Bush, and it's not so easy to be just for human rights because there are other factors at hand. And we've, you know, throughout the Middle East, we've had this, you know, this desire for years, for, de you know, for decades, to have stability in the region and have, you know, non-fundamentalist regimes, or not or regimes that aren't too fundamentalist, like, say, the one in Saudi Arabia, Maybe there it could be worse, right? In terms of more, you know, more extremists, uh, religious extremists running running the government, and, um, and, and you know, having people governments that we can work with, even though they're not very good for their for their people, and certainly aren't democracies. Um, and Egypt has really, you know, characterized this dilemma. President Carter did a did a tremendous thing at Camp David in brokering the peace deal between Israel. And Egypt, which I think led to a tremendous, you know, a lot more stability in that region than, than otherwise would have been there, but it came at a cost. The cost was, you know, billions of dollars in aid to both Israel and Egypt, and tolerance of, you know, first the Sadat government and then the Mubarak government, which were not full-fledged democracies, or, or not, even, not, not even close, not, not even close, the, and you know, yeah. autocratic regimes. But, right. but you know, it. Made you know it, 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 they were the ones able to broker a peace deal, and so I think in the last week, Obama's had to balance, you know, again one of these issues that he inherited, but any president would have, at this point in time, and it's a bi, certainly a bipartisan dilemma. Uh, he had to balance. Okay, you know, we've we've worked with Egypt on our counterterrorism programs, which also includes using their intelligence services to torture people. You know, that we need them to have some stability in terms of the peace deal with, with Israel. And we don't want the Muslim Brotherhood to be, you know, to take over there, even even if that's not, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how big a possibility that really is. I think that, that's probably overblown as a possible outcome. And so you don't want all that to sort of, you know, go poof overnight. And at the same time, I think there is a, I don't know, is there an art to convincing an autocrat to step aside? Are there, are there some ways to handle this where you have a better chance of getting a peaceful, positive resolution than, than not? And if you come out immediately and start throwing him under the bus, then do you just lead to chaos? Right, that, that would be, that, that's a good question. And there would be obviously a lot, a lot of, of analysis of every word uh, that President Obama or Hillary Clinton or Ambassador uh, Wisner has, 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 has said about this. And then, of course, we'll wait for the WikiLeaks version. Uh, <laughs> where we then see, you know, I mean, I, mean, I mean, we should give a shout out, whether it's meant with affection or, or approbation or disapprobation. Uh, to, uh, or know, just to, telling it like it is. To, well, to Assange, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, um, and all the others who, including Al Jazeera, which, which released a cartload of papers about the Palestinians uh, uh, last week or so, um, these clearly have had uh, uh, the kind of seismic effect that people were sort of wondering it would ha they would have in terms of finalizing the dissolution of a lot of people with their governments, including perhaps the U.S. government in the case of, of some Americans, but certainly uh, Tunisia, certainly Egypt, and, and apparently also Yemen. 
uh, with yeah, well, we saw this the, you're just in the last day or two. The, the, the Yemeni president has started changing his cabinet, as we've seen in Jordan as well. I mean, there are a lot of uh, leaders out there who are, you know, I don't say, running scared, maybe overstating it, but they're, but, they're, but they're looking and saying, well, who thought two weeks ago that this could happen in Egypt? If I'm realistic, I have to, you know, take into account that unforeseen events can happen under my own nose here. Yeah, um, yeah. And so, you know, you know, people you know, still can go ahead and demonize Julian Assange, but what he has proven, which is, which, which is in some ways reassuring, is the power of information. Uh, people have information that, you know, if it's accurate, truthful, um, it, can, it, can, it can lead to a certain form of empowerment. And yeah, I, I, would, I would also add uh, another observation, and I mean, I certainly agree, uh, uh, has the, the, the famously gloomy but also incredibly interesting uh, historian Oswald Spengler uh, you know, wrote almost 100 years ago now that uh, every civilization has what he called a form, unquote, a form. Hey, say that again. Hey. Oswald Spengler said every civilization has a, quote, form. Unquote. Form, F-O-R-M. F-O-R-M, as in this is the way they are. Right. You know, like it or like it or lump it. You know, you're just, but it's who they are. And I think what we're now seeing is the a re-emergence of an Islamic form uh, uh, of civilization. It, it, it's, above all else, Muslim. Uh, um, and it will have Egyptian characteristics or Syrian characteristics or Saudi Arabian characteristics or Iranian characteristics, but will have a Muslim quality to it. And I think what we saw over the last 150 years was the submergence of that form, uh, first under the British and the French, uh, and it, it the occasional other uh, you know, colonists like the Italians in, in Libya, um, and then under this sort of so cleverly done, that's almost be hard to see sometimes, American form, uh, we'll, we'll make a deal with your army and equip your military and train your soldiers, and they all come to you know the you know uh, mil you know military academies and schools and training centers in the United States, mm -hmm. and we'll have a kind of an American form, and or at least, but it's a crust, it's a thin crust on top of the civilization. I mean, you know, when you realize that. You know, we all know Muhammad al baradai and like him, and he'd be a great guy to have over for a, you know, a dinner party and, you know, speak in five languages and so on, and out cosmopolitanize us. Uh, then, you, then you look at these people on the streets in Cairo, you know, and the population of Cairo is 18 million. That's, that, is, that is a teeming metropolis if there ever was one. And you realize that there's, they are something different now, and that more to the point, they aspire to something much different uh, for themselves than we would want for them. Uh, that doesn't mean they don't want to pick their own government. So I mean, it just means that they're just well. Again, it's some combination of Islamic Republic and uh, whatever else they might have. And you know, it, it's what we're seeing in Turkey, and in, in, in its own way as well. Uh, you know, it just, you, you can't run a, a, a Muslim civilization with a secular government. It, it just won't last. And so we can make a deal with Sadat until he gets well, killed, well, and we well, can make a know, deal with Mubarak until he gets overthrown. But then we have to deal with the people as they actually and, are. And, but but there, it, it may be, and um, it may take a while to even see if this is true, that the a mixed state of secularists and, and Muslims in, in, in that part of the world might be more feasible if it is native born rather than what you're talking about is you know Americans or the Brits or the Italians or the Libyans or uh, uh, Itali Italians with, with Libya or other Westerners trying to impose but maybe if in some ways left to their own devices uh, you know we saw you know going back a couple of decades now to um, Iran when we overthrew what was a native-born secular democratic government, albeit leaning to the left or even veering to so towards socialism, and we ended up then creating this, you know, the, these decades of resentment, which was which was overthrown then by this Islamic revolution. Uh, so that was an instance where perhaps, you know, in, in the Islamic extremism might have not might have not been the the option of choice had we not been supporting the Shah. In my, you know, may, there, maybe there was a middle approach or a blended approach uh, that was possible. 
And, and, and entirely, and entirely possible. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, so, mo- so, modernizing Islam is certainly uh, right. uh, what, uh, what I mean, plenty, I mean, plenty I mean, of Muslims. I mean, would an Islamic be. Republic, you know, or Islam, Islamic State doesn't have to be, you know, a you know, fundamentalist state, and um, at least that, you know, I don't think so. And um, but, but 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 you know, very few of these countries have been allowed the the, the choice of finding a path on their own. And um, it's you know Egypt's going to be interesting now, perhaps. Particularly, I mean, this is the one thing that the White House is is pushing. Some might say hiding behind, which is okay. The choice now is there. For, the choice there is a choice that has to be made by the Egyptians. And if Al Baraday or other reformists, you know, can pull together a coalition government, with or without Muslim Brotherhood people, but with maybe with other religious, you know, oriented parties. You know, it would be interesting to see how, how this how this shakes out, and then ultimately, what is sustainable, because you know a society with a ballot box, ultimately will you know can't support something that is too artificial. Right, I, I, I agree with that. The only thing I say about Iran, and, I, and look, I, it's pretty clear that the U.S. intervention, Anglo-American intervention in Iran in 1953 to overthrow uh, Mossadegh, uh, Mossadegh, the the, the, the elected leader, who was a sort of a leftist, uh, uh, was quite, kind of, and looked at that sort of a mistake. But I'll make a prediction, just based on the same point, the same Spenglerian point, and that is that if Mossadegh had not been overthrown, if he had proceeded with a, and I, I you know. This is not a prediction. This no, is a, not, it's, it's not, it's just a hunch. It got, yeah. uh, Mossadegh died, I think, in 1967, so it's long past the time to ask him, you know, how he thinks things would have played out for him. But I, I will, I'll bet you that if, if, if Iran had become a, left of center, maybe even pro-Soviet uh, uh, place, um, the same Islamic revolution that overthrew the Shah in 1979, or 78, exactly, I'm not, well, I think it was the Shah left in 78, uh, um, and the government fell in 79, uh, would have probably happened against the Mossadegh regime or its successor down the road. It's just a hunch, and that is that they were, that all these ideologies that we kind of, that we in the West or the East have kind of like, well, like uh, capitalism, and so, so, capitalism and socialism, are both uh, rather alien to Islamic civilization, and so I suspect you again. Who knows where it'll wind up? I mean, and I mean that in the most literal sense. Who knows? Um, and it clearly, democracy has had some effect. The, the, just the language of the protesters and the sense that look, we want a voice and so on that clearly means something. Uh, you know, Michael Mandelbaum. Uh, wrote a book a, a few years ago called "The Ideas That Conquered the World," and one of them was democracy. And, the e- and we even, saw that. We saw that in Iran too. I mean, we saw, we saw it in Iran too. Look, Iran is still more of a democracy than, say, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. No matter what you think of Ahmadinejad, and nobody, nobody likes right. him, but he's still, you know, and it's a far more cosmopolitan society. I mean, right. It, you right. know, I, I'm not sure every American realizes that, but in terms of a, of, a, of, a, of a professional class, and you know, a somewhat battered middle class, and a highly and, 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 and a Pretty advanced system of education. Yeah, and not mention a pretty good nuclear program. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't you? In other words, what we're looking at is this long-term process of sloughing off the West. And but I don't know, but you know, I, I, but, if, but we're looking at Iran. If indeed the the the, the failed revolution of, of last year, um, you know, is a is more of a precursor of what's to come in Iran, rather than you know a you know just a, a, a one-off event. You might be wrong, Jim. Maybe you know in that instance, there you know there in, in Iran, we'll see in the next you know five ten years at some point a move towards a demo, you know a, a more democratic and a more and a more secular, a less officially Islamic government there. Uh, possible. I, don't, I just don't see it yet, that's all. And, yeah, and, yeah, and, and yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that, they, and they, that it's, I, I suspect when we, when we know more about Egypt, we'll, we'll realize to ourselves that for every El Bar and I on television talking to us in English about what he's doing, uh, there were ten uh, Islamic, uh, you know, e- imams or, or you know, uh, clergymen of some kind uh, saying, now look, we're doing this for, for Allah, Allah. Now, again, it's it's a, an important point. The rallying cry in a revolutionary situation is sort of something that's really 
deeply heartfelt in that, in that case, you know, uh, uh, Islam. And so if you want to mobilize, you know, 80 million people around one thing, you're, you're much better off invoking the common faith, that, you know, that uh, Egypt's about, I think, a little bit less than 10% Christian, so clearly there's a another, the Coptic, the Copts are, 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 are a different uh, group here, but this is clearly an Islamic thing. And... You know, again, it it may well have the democratic features that we like, but it will clearly, but it will clearly be a different beast uh, than what we have sort of come to hope and expect out of these Islamic countries. And I think the same thing will wind up being true in Tunisia uh, and Yemen uh, and uh, any anywhere else where this uh, well, uh, Twitter, uh, you know, uh, well, we're, cer we're certainly in the middle of revolution is happening. But um, um, it, 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 I think the first step would be if we could see any sort, any f sort of unity government that represented a lot of the different aspects of Egyptian society, the different, you know, the different forms of Islam, the different or the degrees of, of, of Islam, and you know, and secular components, and and you know, that's, that's obviously you know something to hope for, but. Um, now that Mubarak has has moved to a, a crackdown phase, if he's going to do this, it's obviously going to you know trigger. Well, it will shape the you know what the you know what what the opposition does and what the opposition is and what the opposition turns into. Right. So uh, you know it's it's you know this is um, you know certainly you know what they, in Washington they like to talk about dynamic scoring uh, in policy walk terms at one event sort of. You know, uh, doesn't just trigger react a reaction, but will affect the nature of the reaction, and I think that's what um, we're going to see now in the days ahead. Um, yes, speak, speaking of dialectics and or, or dynamics, uh, I just I, I can't resist. Uh, you know, I will put it up. We'll put it on the website. I wrote a piece for the American, uh, for actually for the Jerusalem Post in February of '03. <laughs> Uh, uh, six weeks before the, the Iraq war, in which I said, "Look, we'll have an easy, America will have an easy time winning in Iraq." Uh, well, you were uh, wrong about that. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I meant militarily, in the well, sense of like capturing by winning, but capturing yeah. Baghdad. No, I, but, that, but then I, what I said was, "Is that we're going to see something emerge, which is a backlash, a dialectic to that?" And, and mm -hmm. the analogy that I used uh, was Isaiah Berlin's uh, actually two essays about the German counter enlightenment. And I reminded uh, readers that, that you know that when the revolutionary France had first burst forth in 1789, and then you know crossed over into the into Germany, and the, you know to you know liberate Germany or at least or con liberate or conquer Germany, your choice. Uh, at first, the German the German intelligentsia, the German you know uh, uh, liberals. Uh, the, of the era, were extremely happy, extremely delighted to see the French come and overthrow their local, you know, uh, you know, duke or, 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 or you know, prince or whatever it was, in their little, you know, little post sap country, part of Germany. And it took about ten years before the Germans realized that they hated the French, uh, that whatever whatever virtues of French republicanism were there, there were, uh, they were overwhelmed by you know the cultural affront of having France uh, occupy Germany. And the, the most famous example is Beethoven. You know, Beethoven originally had intended to uh, you know, dedicate the the, the the third symphony to Napoleon, and then then changed his mind. And, you know, you can find the document. He scratched out Napoleon's name and, and you know instead dedicated it you know and essentially to the German people. And as Isaiah Berlin pointed out, that set in motion you know 150 years of German hostility to you know the West and France and you know sort of and we know how that turned out. and we know how that turned out yes. and, and and so I said that the I, I something tells me that the same process of, of a counter enlightenment uh, is which is, did, didn't begin with the U.S. invasion of Iraq, but certainly was accelerated by it. Well, 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 well uh, is, is it going to happen now? We're going to see it play out for a good long time. Well, speaking of a counter enlightenment. You want to talk about health care <laughs> and repeal? I mean, in a, in a smaller way, uh, people, liberals and Democrats, were overwhelmed by Barack Obama's what seemed to be tremendous victory. I mean, he only won 53 to 47 percent, uh, but it, you know, it seemed rather uh, decisive at the time, and it seemed as if the Republicans were total trash at the time, and yet there was a counter enlightenment um, and it, it led to the House Republicans voting you know, perhaps somewhat meaninglessly but maybe not for you 
to repeal the Obama health care bill, lock, stock, and precondition uh, a week or two back. Uh, the Senate Republicans are, uh, are angling to have a, a vote maybe even later this week on, on, on repeal. I don't think it's going to go anywhere because <laughs> it's not going to pass in the Senate. But nevertheless, we saw a case this, uh, this week in which one judge said that the whole law was unconstitutional, which now, which to tally it, you know, there have been four federal judges who have looked at this. Two have said it's constitutional. Two have said it's not. Basically, this is going to be decided by one guy, you know, Anthony uh, Kennedy in the Supreme Court. I wish we could just put it on his desk tomorrow and say, here, <laughs> let us know when you have a decision. Um, but you wanted to talk about health. I'm tired of talking about health care reform, but you want, well, not even reform. It's, it's now an act. But you want well, to say I, I mean, first of all, I, I thought it was amusing to see that the Stephanie Cutter, who was a, the, the, a new title I hadn't heard before, the deputy senior advisor uh, at the White House, uh, uh, had a blog posting uh, today in which she, or maybe it was yesterday, um, in which she said that, I, that the White House is appalled by the, quote, judicial activism, unquote, of this judge in Florida, Vincent. And, uh, you know, where have we heard that phrase before? You know, uh, you know it, it does seem that whichever party is happy with the status quo accuses the other party of, you know, radicalism or activism or something. And so, well, that's you know. right. But I mean, I've, I, I've, I've always said that, you know, when, when, when um, the, the right, which has sort of made a cottage industry out of the judicial activism charge, you know, they're always happy when they find judges like Judge Vincent and I think a Reagan appointee down in Florida who went beyond what the case in front of him was, which was very on the mandates, and said, eh, you know, the mandates are crucial to the whole bill. I'm just going to strike the whole thing down. Uh, you know, one can argue the merits of that back and forth, but, you know, the, the, the Federalist, before I had, even, I had even heard about the decision, I was getting press releases through email from the Federalist Society praising the decision. The Federalist Society <laughs> basically exists to denounce liberal judicial activism. And um, so I really think there's a, you know, I, I think we should sort of, you know, uh, have a moratorium on that charge. Uh, but we, we could, it, but it, again, we have to then have a moratorium on most of the disputatious left versus right. And, I'm, and I mean, both well, we sides just here. argue the facts it, of the case. In, in, invoking the of the Constitution. Right. Well, whether, whether, the, yeah, well, yeah, whether, yeah, whether the decision was wrong or right. And, right, you know, right. You know, and, argue that, you know, and, and leave, you know, I'm not a big fan of this no labels movement, but leave this label to the side. But nevertheless, you know, this will go up and it will be inside, you know, and, it, it, you know, this whole week, you know, each side has argued whether the decision is good or bad. And I saw today that Charles Freed, the Solicitor General, you know, always during the Bush years, um, you know, said that, you know, of course, this bill is con law is constitutional. Well, you know, he's a conservative, and so the liberals love that <laughs> pronouncement right now. If he had said the other, they wouldn't be quoting him. Right. Yeah. Barbara, know, Bush, Barbara Bush, the younger, has now become a huge hero because she's now for gay marriage, and so all of a sudden, whatever you know, sins were attributed to her and her family. Well, and, and, I'm sure and anyone ever bl I, mean, I, never, you, I never blamed her for the Iraq War, but, uh, <laughs> but, she, but she and and the, and, 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 and the McCain daughter, you know, are. Right. are are um, useful. Now, uh, they've, blown, they've blown out of office, both of them. Yes, and, yeah. and, and, no, look, it's totally shameless. Uh, when the Republicans control the White House, they celebrate executive authority. When, when they don't control the White House, but they do control the Congress, they celebrate congressional oversight. Uh, and the same thing with the Democrats. Uh, uh, you know, they, they, when they have the White House, I mean, in other words, you, 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 like, cert, certain symbols of which the Constitution is certainly way up there are so powerful that you seek to wrap yourself even in a, even in a scoundrelous uh, nature uh, in it. So you say the Constitution says the exact opposite of what my opponent says, and if my opponent changes his mind and is for it, then I'll be well, against it. And so and it, it does become kind of a joke after a while. I mean, right. this, is, this is why, you know, the Tea Party cry of just going back and, you know, sticking to the Constitution you know, it just strikes me, and this is going to sound, you know, somewhat dismissive, as, as immature or childish. Because in our grand history as, as a nation, the one thing that has always been a constant 
is that we argue over what the Constitution means when applied to laws and events that the Founding Fathers never could have envisioned. And Founding Mothers, if there are any. And, and, and so, you know, we can't just go and say if it's in the Constitution, not in the Constitution. You know, lasers, nuclear weapons, cell phones, all this stuff um, are, you know, are, are, are not in the Constitution. And this is what we fight about. And it's, you know, and that's something that, you know, I guess is a positive thing. And, you know, there are times when, you know, when, when, when one set of, one overriding interpretation is in ascendance, and one, and then when another one is, a conservative view or liberal view is, 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 is not, and then it rises. And um, this whole notion that, you know, that, that, that we Tea Party is alone, or that, you know, Michelle Bachman, or anyone you, pick, you want to pick someone on the left, that we know what's constitutional or not, you know, it just strikes me as being... Silly. We fight these fights out, and we're going. And, and hopefully, we'll be doing this for the next couple of hundred years, uh, if we're still here as the world, as a nation. And that's just the way it is. Get used to it. Get over it. <laughs> right, but we, have, we, we can't have fun voting the ironies of things. I mean, I, I, I'm old enough to remember, frankly, so are you, uh, in the impeachment hearings of 1974, uh, when uh, Congresswoman Barbara, Barbara Jordan of Texas, uh, you know, black Democrat. Uh, said, you know, that, 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 that I'm now part of this great constitutional process and I'm the daughter of sharecroppers and the granddaughter of slaves. And, you know, that, that she was a hero to Democrats for invoking the Constitution. I mean, the, the Constitution didn't have any more mind about, you know, what Richard Nixon was going to be up to 150 years after they were all dead. Right. Uh, um, but they couldn't resist. But anyway, it, it's... Yeah, it, it, let's just call it situational, situational constitutionalism. <laughs> and, uh, but me, meanwhile, I, mean, I, I am struck by the, and this is the point we've made before, at least I have, um, <laughs> the, the, that that the healthcare debate continues to revolve around you know this this narrow stratum of what the healthcare experience is for the average American. I know, like, I, you know, and that is. You know, uh, health insurance is not the same as health. You know, uh, when, you, when you open up the paper and there's new, you know, dis arguments and discoveries about you know everything from breast cancer to obesity, and you realize, look, what the real the real frontier here, the only way that we're going to make healthcare more affordable, is by making it better. Well, the, uh, this is where you know you and I you know agree on that. I mean, we've talked about the need for innovation, which is actually interesting that uh, that, that Obama. Has you know in his State of the Union speech, I don't know if we've spoken since then, but um, uh, you know made innovation one of his you know five pillars or watchwords, whatever you want to call it. But I don't think he, I'm not sure he, he applied it directly to healthcare and particularly you know cures and, 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 and treatments. And um, I've always thought that you know you know the, the president, Democratic president, you know, presidential candidate should come out and talk about you know. The, you know, very simple things that can improve you know people's lives that are very universal. In, in this country, for instance, we, we don't have a right. People don't have a right to vacations. You know, uh, I would. You know, you know, there are things about you know the, the, the child slave uh, labor laws and things like that. I always said, you know, listen. I think there should be a right to a vacation, one week, two week, whatever, and that'd be immensely popular. But putting that aside, if you went out there and said, listen. I'm going to make it, you know, instead of, you know, uh, you know, if this is a Sputnik moment, let's make it, as you've suggested, Jim, you know, you know curing Alzheimer's. Let's, you know, f you know, f you know, flood cancer research field with, with more money and less money for Afghanistan. Uh, let's, you know, do something in a way that hopefully in the next five, ten years will affect you or your, someone you know. In your family. Well, I, I think it'd be great. I, again, I think you. Would, and, and, and no, but, about but no, but no one. You know, I mean, there, there was talk in the last campaign. Barack Obama did talk about you know, more money for cancer research in the National Institutes of Health. Bush, to his credit, tried to direct some more money in that direction too. But nobody's ever made this a big deal. Or cleared away the regulatory and legal and litigious hurdles that are that are in in the way. You know, I mean, if you turn on any cable news channel, for any cable news channel, you see nothing but ads for sue the pharmaceutical company. Uh, 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 you right, know, I some, see some ads drug. for 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 drugs that um give you all these um side effects that you, <laughs> we can't talk about. Well, there, there, there's, 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 what's, what's, what I'm afraid is happening is that the, the, the pharmaceutical companies will be channeled into making certain drugs that they they know are are or are pretty sure are harmless, or at least, I mean, not in a sense of a side effect, 
and then give up on everything else. I mean, for example, I think we can agree that, that diabetes is a more serious health issue than uh, <clears throat> erectile dysfunction. Um, and so when, when, when Glaxo is looking at a $6 billion hit on Avandia, uh, which has never been proven to do any harm to anybody, so it's been inferred but not proven, um, and now they you know, think they're going to make another diabetes drug ever? Of course not. Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean... I know. I mean, that would, well, and then, so I think. That yeah, I'm not. I'm not was, was, listen, let me. I'm, I'm, you know, let's just agree to disagree. I'm not going to go out there and, and blame the lawyers on this. I mean, let's just stick to to our consensus. Well, on the, 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 okay. The, the, the question is, we, 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 even in, even in this regulatory regime regimen that you don't like and you think it's problematic. I think there's probably a lot of things that, that, that aren't covered well, and there's a lot of lobbying that, 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 that gets things approved that probably you know, prematurely that shouldn't be, that aren't fully safe. But putting that all aside, whether you take the John Grisham view or the Jim Pickens view, there does seem to be a lot of room in between for, you know, for, for, for goosing up health, you know, innovation in terms of, you know, delivery and care. Right. Well, imagine this, David. Suppose the, suppose the president, this is what I think you, do, you and I do agree Suppose the president got up and said, you know, like Kennedy, I'm going to the moon, or like Lincoln and the railroads. Uh, we, as a nation, this is an important project for us to achieve. You know, we, uh, uh, and, and then if, if American history and tradition mean anything, it would mean a public-private partnership, uh, or if you prefer a private-public partnership, uh, uh, where these things would happen. And then there'd have to be some. Then I think it's it, inevitable. I mean, when we, when nobody, no trial lawyer was suing uh, the Manhattan Project uh, in the middle of World War II, saying I fell off a ladder and now I want to sue Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Well, I, I, I imagine it, it, there are a lot of lawsuits about the Transcontinental Railroad. Actually, there, there weren't because it wasn't allowed. That's the, point. That, that's the point. That's the point. If you, if you, again, if you want okay, something, let's, all, let's, all let's leave history, the just leave the lawyers out of this for now. Because well, I mean, I say you, you, you I can't. I really don't you, believe that's the, you know, that's what's blocking. You know, well, put this way: if there's if the, the, total, me, the total medical R and D budget of the country is 113 billion. Okay, all medical R and D for everything. That's the NIH. That's the private companies. Right, 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 right. Like that's 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 philanthropies, and, uh, foundations, and so on. Now, hmm. you just do the math. If, if the if if it's 113 billion for medical, which I I think it should be triple. I think it should be yeah, quadruple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But th then you got to ask yourself, uh, how how much of the money that in, in a world of scarce resources and deficits that we're going to set aside this much money, which I, again I don't think would come from the public. I think it would come from private investment. How much of that in turn do we want to hand over to the trial lawyers? Now, again, you, so the, lead, the leader, President David Korn, would say, listen, if the goal here is to cure Alzheimer's, then is it, does it really make sense to allow lawsuits against the people who are trying to get to do the work? Depends what those you, people are doing. Well, okay, if they're, if they're, committing, cri if they're committing crimes, they yeah, put them in jail. They're doing. If they're, 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 but if, if, they're, if they're doing something they're, they're, they're that the, pretty, FD, that the FDA has approved. If they're research that shows that the other drugs are not as safe as they claim to be, then I say go at them. No, but, but that's what the FDA is you know, to I'll, I'll, I'll make you a bargain, Jim. I would say, you know, if there was better criminal enforcement, and, and, uh, and you know, often, you know, it's hard getting at the people who make these decisions because of the of corporate structuring. That if you know you could put those people in jail, then maybe you wouldn't need the the the, the disincentive of, of of cash, you know, penalties. Well, this this is what so, you need. So we can, we can we can we can start by changing you know the the, the nature of of, of, of of how of corporations and how they cloak li human right. liability. A, a good point. This is why we need President David Corn to <laughs> say, look, he, here's how we're going to do it. And I mean, the obvious reform to me is that if the FDA approved it, if they did. And if the company made it in good faith, you know, if they did, uh, according to the rules that the FDA set, then, I, then you shouldn't be able to sue them. Now, that, again, I, I realize that under the current environment where they, the, the pharmaceutical companies want to be free to do whatever they want in terms of drugs, uh, that, that the politics of shielding companies from those lawsuits will never occur. Because in the, in the mind of the public, to, you know, plenty of people say, look, they're, they're not making a cure for Alzheimer's. They're not making a cure for cancer. You know, they're, they're, they're making a cure for restless leg syndrome or low T or ED or perimenopause or something. So the, the grand bargain that, again, President Corn would have to oversee would be, look, if you want to make the stuff that we don't care about, you're sort of on your own. You know, like, this, like the, you know, so on. But if, you, but if you're making something that's going to keep the country from going bankrupt, like an Alzheimer's cure relative to, 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 to Medicare yeah, and Social Security, well. then obviously we're going to have to look at 
all the impediments to getting these things done I would do, I would in, do a, in a different way. I would take the Daryl Issa approach. I would say, send me your list of impediments. <laughs> send me your list, and I, let, I post them on the Internet. I post my invitation, and then I'll say, okay, let's go through these one by one and see what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, what protects research, what just protects the bottom line, and, and realizing there is a connection between the both. But, but, so, that's, but an ex, that's an excellent so, approach, I, I, and I think you see, though, that every other big project that America undertook, railroads, telephone network, uh, canals, broadcast television, the Internet, uh, fighting wars, all took place behind a legal shield that doesn't exist now for the pharmaceutical industry, or the medical industry in general. All of them. No, no, so you say, are we really able to do something new here? I mean, we, is, is President Corn really going to be able to, to, to second, launch a new approach to do, we, a we crash built, project without these kinds of shields we, that have always built, been necessary we, in the past? We built the best muscle cars in the world without protections and liability. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think I, I, I understand your point. I think you may be overstating the case in the history, but. As soon as we get in the White House, you're in charge of the committee. <laughs> um, but, right, but, remember, but speaking of the White House, speaking of the White House, because I, I okay. have to run. Okay. I want to just, you know, just a quick roundup of Republican presidential um, silliness or non-silliness. We okay. had the Huntsman bubble, true or true bubble, uh, this week. We have Mitt Romney, you know, saying that you know it's fine to do mandates if you're in the, if you're a state, but not federally. I'm not sure that's going to really help them much with, with Republican conservatives. And we have nobody yet w willing to say, yes, I am running for president on the Republican side. Okay. And this time in the cycle last time, I believe a lot of people had already declared. So why, why are people late? Doesn't Kim Mitt Romney, you know, run away from Mitt Care or Romney Care in Massachusetts? And can John Hudson, a fellow who worked for Obama, who supported Cap and trade and gay civil unions, you know, does he even have a reason to be looking in the mirror and saying, yes, I can? Yeah, I'm, I'm very intrigued by husband, who I, I've never met, uh, 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 so I have no, no opinion on him uh, beyond just what I've read. Uh, um, if he didn't look so good, you'd be less it, intrigued, admit it. Well, I, I probably, probably, and that's true for a lot of people in America. That's right. But what intrigues me, though, is you would think that in Salt Lake City, out there, you know, uh, you know, Mormon high command, if there is one, uh, they would be saying, "Look, we're a small enough group anyway. Do we really, you know, should, shouldn't we tell Huntsman to wait his turn?" Yeah, uh, that's let, let, let the Mormon vote. Let, let men have his chance. I mean, I, I, and obviously that's not happening. I mean, well, I mean, Hunts, Huntsman, Hunts, the Huntsman family is fabulously rich. They could, they might well be saying, "Look, we don't care what, you know, Gordon Hinckley or whoever, uh, you know, thinks thinks about this." Uh, um, or may, uh, my my guess would be that Huntsman is just simply knows that if he says something like. But he's been saying that you and I and every every other talking head in the country will give him the kind of name ID that will help him not in 2012 but in, in 2016. 2016. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean I, that would be my guess. I mean, the premise it, it, being it, it, that people can remember five years from now. Well, it, yeah. it, 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 it's all cumulative. A little bit helps. I, I, for example, I don't particularly think that Michelle Bachman is going to run for president. Um, but I'm oh, sure don't she... disappoint me! <laughs> Come on, don't, Jim. Do, do, do not. Take that away from me. Don't take away what you want to talk about on, with, on Rachel Maddow or Chris Matthews or whoever. Yeah, I know. I, I, I think for the time being, you're safe because <laughs> I think she. she, she it, yeah. it doesn't matter what Jim Pinkerton says. It's what she yeah, says. If she says she's running, she'll get invited to the debates all across the country in in, in the calendar year 2011, and then have plenty of time to get back in the race to run for re-election as uh, a, a representative from. I think from six crazy, town. Of <laughs> crazy Town, Minnesota. I think Minnesota Six, I think we call it. Um, I, I do think, back to Mitt Romney, I think, he'll, I think he, in, in Republican terms, I think he'll have a very hard time. Uh, like, like very, very hard uh, overcoming the, the, the mandate issue. Every time that, you know, David Axelrod or Obama or, or you know, Ezra oh, Klein or uh, where Matt Aguzia says, you know, hey, you know, Romney Care was the antecedent to Obamacare. And it came um, out of the Heritage Foundation. <laughs> and it came, I know, it's true, it's been, it's been a huge change. This was a conservative approach so that we wouldn't, so that these are from conservatives who were afraid that we'd move to a single payer system. So they came up with a free market based mandate system. So this is, you know, nothing that came from the left. And yet, everyone sees this as this great socialist tyranny. Well, well I, I, think, I think what we're discovering is that there's a libertarian end of the Republican Oops. spectrum, way beyond, hello? 
Are you there? I lost yeah, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> the, 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 I mean, the, right, the, 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 there's another third of the ideological spectrum that has only opened up in the last five or so years. You know, I mean, remember, this is only three, year, three years ago now, in, in, in 2008, that Ron Paul, Ron Paul, not Rand Paul, Ron yeah. Paul was basically thrown off the Republican uh, uh, debate uh, presidential roster just because they didn't like him. Now, I, guess now I mean, the Tea Party, Rand, Ron Paul, Rand Paul, uh, you know, a, a lot of others are arguably, uh, you know, the, if not the base of the Republican Party, at least a, a, a major portion of it. So I think that the country has, and I've actually been thinking about this, the country has, the, the, the old conservative alternative was exactly that, the Heritage Foundation yeah. mandate, and now the new conservative or more precisely libertarian uh, solution is uh, uh, like nothing, uh, you know, freedom, liberty, uh, no mandate, however you want to call it. Yeah. Um, and that has left Romney, frankly, the Heritage Foundation and its old incarnation with Stuart Butler and so on, uh, 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 and a lot of other sort of who thought of themselves as right-tilting economists and social scientists and so on, uh, looking now uh, very much in the middle and, and all of a sudden discover that Barack Obama uh, is their champion, which is probably not what they had in mind. That's just one of those ironies of, 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 of politics, and a reminder that it's a you know you, it's a it's a you know the, the center or the, the optimum is a is a moving target. Okay, and let that be a lesson to you children at home. <laughs> I gotta run. So I'll, All right, go, I'll go. let that be the last word. Go do a real TV show. All right. Okay. Th bye. Thanks, David. All right. Bye bye. <laughs>